John, thank you so much for joining me on Fraud Busting today. Great to be here. Thanks for having me. Oh, yeah. Now, we are colleagues uh, in the speaking world and it, at the National Speakers Association, So, but we hadn't managed to, to meet, so now's our time. That's right. We get to meet virtually. We do. We do. Um, so tell us a little bit about about you because you're you're retired fbi and, and your history uh i've been going over it is um impressive to say the least and you've it seems like you've had your hand in a little bit of everything so i'll, I'll let you talk about the in, things that are most intriguing to you about what you've done great well i started off as a police officer in san diego years ago went to law school got my law degree practice law before joining the fbi so Let's get it out of the way. I went from uh, one hated profession to another along the way. But, uh, yeah, you did. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Great. But in the FBI, I had some great opportunities. I was able to work some major cases, including the 9-11 attack, Oklahoma City bombing, for those people who remember that far back, the Sony hack. I was on scene uh, when Gabby Giffords, uh, shortly after she was shot. So I've done a lot of different things in the FBI, and that's what I speak on now, basically, how to keep yourself safe, your business safe in both the physical world and the cyber world. Now, because don't you have an honorary cyber security degree from, uh, did I see that in your, in your bio? I've done a lot of work over my FBI career as uh, in the cyber field. I ran cyber investigations for the FBI in Washington. I ran squads in the field. And so I was recognized by one of the universities out here in Arizona with an honorary doctorate. That, and, you know, five hours will get you a cup of coffee. But uh, it's nice to be recognized and appreciated. Oh. I've also helped a local university develop a cyber program uh, because the reality is when we think of threats out there, it's all cyber. And it's going to be more and more of cyber in the future. So we need to train the people coming up along the way how to keep themselves safe how to keep businesses safe. Okay, now I, I want to talk about that, but let's go let's go back a little bit further because I am really curious about the Oklahoma City bombing. And reason being sure. is um, I uh, I grew up in Dallas and that, that it hit home to us uh, because it's the next city up the street. And um, I, I went there to see it and it was very um, uh, shocking, I guess you'd say. Um, I mean, the, when I was there, I think they they cleared out most of the main building, but the building across the street was still uh, blown up. I mean, it looked like something you'd see on the news in Beirut or like not in America. So what what did you can you talk much about what you did along those lines? Sure. And I uh, spent a lot of time there. I've been there afterwards as well. The memorial they have is spectacular. It for is. anybody watching, if you haven't visited the Oklahoma City Memorial, it is one of the great museums we have here in the United States and did a wonderful job honoring not only the people killed, but especially there were 19 young children in a daycare center that were killed as well. So I worked that investigation pretty much exclusively for a year. Myself and 1,400 other FBI agents they threw into this case. I, at the time, was stationed in Flint, Michigan, which is near the Nichols Farm, the co-conspirators who helped put this bombing plan together. So I focused on that aspect of the uh, investigation. Uh, Tim McVeigh, the bomber, he had actually traveled the country, probably passed through Dallas, looking for targets to attack. And one of the reasons he focused on the uh, Alfred E. Merrow building in Oklahoma was the fact that it did have a daycare center because he wanted to hurt us as much as he can. And, you know, you kill an adult, we'll be upset, but you kill our children, we'll be extremely upset. And terrorists know this. Well, Tim McVeigh was a terrorist, and that's why he did what he did to try to get at the American people. Now, I would also add, look at how our world's changed. It was Oklahoma City that uh, now you can't pull up and park in front of a building. Now we have barricades everywhere around buildings. All of that did not exist before Oklahoma City. We recognize how we have to keep buildings separated and move back from the street. It changed the FBI. All of our buildings now have what we call blast perimeters around them. Oh, wow. Meaning if you plant a bomb, it's going to have to be far enough away from the building 
that it won't do damage. Our building in Arizona used to be downtown Phoenix. We shared office space with other private businesses. Can't do that anymore. So now we're far out of the city in a big area of land around us. Huh, interesting. So did you find any pertinent evidence in that case or what, um, what was your job, so to speak? Well, my job was to go out and do all sorts of things. At the time, we were looking for unsub, the unidentified person number two people had said existed. We literally shagged thousands of leads on that. I went around the state interviewing various people. Uh, no evidence whatsoever. And that's one of the things witnesses see something you have to vet it out. The media kind of ran with it that there was another person. I went around and talked to oil distributors throughout the state to see where they may have gotten their supplies from because he built the bomb with uh, ammonia and other materials to try to create this bomb, which you would get from like an oil distributor, not an unusual entity in a farming state like Michigan where you need to run tractors, et cetera. Uh, one of the big issues was, you know, why did Tim uh, McVeigh get Terry Nichols to help him? Why would anybody commit such a crime? These two had a close relationship in the Army. They were buddies. It looks as if that uh, Terry Nichols had done some criminal things to assist uh, Tim McVeigh and vice versa. So this is just another in many acts that these two uh, losers essentially were engaging in. Wow. Wow. That is crazy. Cause yeah, that was, gosh, I, I, I think I might've been in high school um, towards the end of high school, I think. So yeah, that that's, man, that's stuck in my mind. So, okay. Moving forward. I'm glad you're on the case. I'm glad we got, cause, cause those guys are in, um, are they still around there in jail? Are they not? Or. Well, Terry, uh, Terry Nichols is in Supermax in uh, your own Colorado. Yeah, we got it here. You bet. Where he'll be the rest of his life. And Tim McVeigh was actually uh, <clears throat> received a uh, death sentence and was executed uh, back in the uh, late 80s, early 90s. Got it. Okay, I'm not, I wasn't up on that, but man, I'm glad we're rid of him. So, um, all right, moving on. What, um, what's some of the more interesting things, like the Sony hack? Because that, uh, that was with the, um, uh, the North Korean film, right? Um, Oh. Right. And there were actually two Sony hacks. So I had exposure to both of them. Uh, the first Sony hack was about five, six years earlier when everybody in the world was on PlayStation and somebody uh, enabled to hack into Sony and shut down the abilities. This gaming that goes on around the country with various people, it's big money. You pay fees every month. You're buying the equipment. We're talking literally billions of dollars. Oh, it's, it's bigger than the movies. The gaming oh, is yeah. bigger than, yeah. And uh, so somebody was able to hack in uh, and shut the system down, causing chaos and losses of significant amount of money. Uh, we worked that investigation and we were able to track the culprit down to some college kid in Arizona. Uh, really? And so showed up at his classroom one day at college and was able to arrest him there and uh, take him away. Uh, after that, we had the hack again involving Sony because Sony, that film, the interview, uh, right. right, which involved North Korea. What's interesting there is most people think this was some sort of sophisticated attack by North Korea and that they were doing these intrusions into our computer systems. Sony wound up losing probably about $3 billion in losses, not to mention people were fired. You may recall that uh, they were able to dig into emails and find exchanges that were inappropriate from the CEO. Oh, to man. And so never put anything in an email you wouldn't want the world to read because... <laughs> you know, yeah. But uh, at the end of the day, that cyber hack, like most cyber hacks, are not terribly sophisticated. It's referred to as brute force. If I was to target your computer and try to hack into it by finding a back door, all Sony did was they clicked on a link from an email that was sent out by North Korea and that link had malware. Somebody at Sony clicked on it, 
that spread malware throughout the computer system. It gave North Korea access to their computers and they were able to go in and basically mess with the company because of the movie they had made, which was derogatory towards North Korea. Still, it was a hack. It cost Sony a lot of money, jobs, etc. You may recall at the time that uh, North Korea, right at the same time, lost their internet access for a couple of days. And uh, there's no internet access. Now, that was clear with the U.S. government firing a shot over the bow, letting North Korea know, if you mess with our people, we can mess with your people. But let's put it in perspective. That's North Korea. So, you know, Sony lost $3 billion. Maybe seven people in North Korea couldn't get on Facebook. So it's very disproportionate of what uh, happens in each country. So the important thing is protect your own system so that places like North Korea can't get into your computer system. Well, the, the thing that I noticed about that is that um, I would have never seen that movie, but now uh, when the hack happened, it, because North Korea got so upset, I, I had to go see it. <laughs> and, okay. and it wasn't anything um, spectacular by any stretch. I mean, it was funny, but... I guess they don't like anybody making them look uh, second best. Yeah, clearly North Korea doesn't have a sense of humor. It was, uh, you know, had they not drawn all the attention to it, far fewer people probably would have seen the movie, but then it became everybody needed to see it. Sony actually made it available very inexpensive online if you wanted to watch it at home. So North Korea did wonders for advertising that movie in the long run. Oh, absolutely. Now. Um, let's see, there's so much we can talk about because, because I do want to get into, you know, what people can do to protect themselves. And, and I'm, you've written a couple books and I'm so curious about this because, you know, I'm a body language expert and, um, I think being aware of your surroundings is, is vital because most of us are just asleep at the wheel. We don't even know it. Mm -hmm. And, um, this, this book, how to spot a terrorist before it's too late. Tell us what, Tell me, I, I haven't read the book, um, but the title is so intriguing that I'm going to have to buy it now. <laughs> and so, so tell us what's, um, what are some of your main uh, points in there? Well, first of all, let me tell you, the reason I wrote the book was for years and years in the government, we've had that, if you see something, say something. But I've never heard anybody tell us what we should be looking for. Now, as a law enforcement officer, I know, I understand what the warning signs are. I wanted to be able to write a book to help the general public because terrorism is alive and well here in the U.S. There are people who want to commit acts, and there's always telltale signs. If we had a warning, we'd be able to take action and prevent certain things from happening. So, for example, disguises. Terrorists will pretend to be mailmen. Uh, UPS delivery persons, et cetera. So that way they can gain access to the building to case things, check out locations. Going back to what we were talking about with the Oklahoma City bombing, Terry McVeigh did, uh, excuse me, Tim McVeigh did the exact same thing, casing buildings, walking hallways. So we had a case in New Jersey where terrorists uh, dressed as pizza delivery persons to gain access to a military base and go in and be able to scope out the base to decide where they wanted to carry out attacks. They were able to get one person got a job at a pizza place. He got pizza boxes. He got uniforms for the, the shirts they wear and gave them to the other terrorists. Uh, we'll see similar things in theft of security guard uniforms, theft of police uniforms, so that terrorists can pose as these people. If you see somebody who appears to be a certain type of person, but maybe doesn't know what they're doing. We've picked out police officers that were really terrorists because they weren't wearing the uniform properly. Oh. Bad on the wrong side, name tag not properly displayed. Things that any officer would know, but maybe the new ones. If you think there's something amiss, report it. We'll look into it. If it's legitimate, nobody's getting arrested. It's not like we're gonna run out and snatch somebody off the street. But it gives us a chance to question, find out, maybe do a little digging. Mm -hmm. So that's just one of the many tips in the book of what we look for. Uh, I also want to add that no terrorist attack just happens. They always do a dry run. Um, oh, really? Take so 
9-11, this was very uh, prominent in that all the terrorists on that day had taken many plane flights, checking out the routes, the procedures on the airlines, etc. One of the stories in my book involves the actor James Woods. He was flying from Boston to L.A. on one of the very flights several weeks before, and he reported to the cockpit during the flight, you know, we have about four people on this plane acting very suspicious. The FBI went back and looked. Sure enough, it was the hijackers had booked flights on that same flight weeks before doing a test run to see how the crew responded. Now, what were they doing? Can you reveal that? So, like, I mean, because we're all starting to get back on planes again. Um, sure. And they were, what they were doing was they were looking at the procedures, how the flight crew interacted. Back then, remember the cockpit door they used to leave open. You could look at the yeah. side, all those things. Uh, there had been cases of them getting, first of all, many of them were just sitting there doing nothing on a six hour flight, not reading, not eating just observing. That's odd in itself, and that's what called the attention of people. Uh, we had one case where two people running a test run, they got up from the back of the plane, walked all the way to the front, tried to get into the cockpit, claiming they thought it was the lavatory. Uh, the plane actually made an emergency landing where the FBI came on board, took the people off involved and interviewed them. Turns out they had been on like 40 flights previously, so clearly they knew where the lavatory was versus the cockpit. Right. But that's not enough to arrest somebody. This was pre-9-11. We suspected it might be somebody planning a hijacking, so the thought was to keep an eye on them. They actually you know, moved to the Middle East shortly afterwards and did not return. So they probably were removed from any operations that were going to take place because they had been identified. If things like that, we want people, if they see, let law enforcement know so they can take a look at. Wow. Because like, because people actually have to be caught doing something wrong to be arrested. You can't just arrest on suspicion. I mean, other countries will do that, but we don't do that. So what's your thought on that? Good practice, bad practice? Should we ramp things? I mean, law enforcement is under so much scrutiny right now. And some of it's justified, but some of it's like, you know, we still need to protect ourselves here. So what's your thought on that? So let me be clear. First of all, with everything going on with law enforcement, uh, I'll go on record and say right now, we have the second worst system in the entire world. Really? As, uh, yes. Who, who has system, the worst? Everyone else. Okay. Oh. It doesn't get any better than it is here. So I've traveled the world. It's just amazing how law enforcement operates. We have a constitution, even when you go to places like England, which is a very nice first world country, they don't have a constitution. You don't see the protests over there that you see here in the US because they can just arbitrarily say, we're not gonna have any protests today. You're not allowed to protest or you'll be arrested. Oh. Uh, I've gone to other countries, taught at foreign police academies where they'll say, one day I remember hearing, when you're interviewing somebody, you never, never, never torture the person you're interviewing. But if you have to torture them, and that's how they do business. So, oh you know, and this is the realities of what's going on in the world today. There are problems here in the US, but it's such a complex problem. It's very easy to go out and protest. How many people protesting actually understand the operations of the system? So. Zero. We have 850,000 police officers in the United States. We have 16, excuse me, 18,000 police departments in the United States. So when you talk about retraining police, you have to actually retrain 18,000 departments with 18,000 separate policies. We don't have a national police force because we didn't want to be Nazi Germany. We purposely designed our system so that it's separate and independent. Uh, the other thing I would add is for anybody watching, while people were upset with police departments, police departments don't make their policy. Right. The, the city government and the state makes the policy. So when you hear talk about various things you're unhappy with, people need to be protesting their government because the cops can only do what the city empowers them to do and decides is lawful. 
a lot of times I see cowardly politicians standing by and they're the very ones that made the policies you're unhappy with. So, um, and then finally, uh, not to get on my soapbox here, but when you talk about defunding the police, the next step then would be to go out and hire security guards, which won't have nearly the training, level of education, et cetera. So you may be going from the frying pan into the fire in the process. I think there's a lot of room for improvement, but we have to have a discussion about it. And just arguing the point is not going to fix anything. Oh, exactly. Yeah, that defunding the police. I'm not a, not a fan. Um... So let's get back. Let's get back to this, how to spot a terrorist. So we know, um, like, like you, you've named off a few things, but what, what else can we be looking for? Like walking down the street every day or what, like, wh where's a good place to look or tell, tell me more. Well, acts of sabotage is another thing. When you uh, have the experience that somebody has done something purposeful, it may be an attempt or a practice for terrorism. For example, in California, on 9-12 of 2001, there were power lines cut throughout certain areas of the state. Really? Now, and shutting down power to community. Uh, that wasn't coincidence. Uh, it was a, but it was probably lone offenders who supported the terrorism acts on 9-11 and wanted to do their part to help contribute. And that's the real dangerous part with terrorism. It's one thing to have a conspiracy with so many people involved and try to prevent it from happening. Unfortunately, we were unsuccessful. We didn't have a clue that was taking place. But when you have somebody sitting at their home preparing a bomb who has no plans on working with anybody else, there's nobody to tip us off. And so that's why it's really incumbent upon the public if you think, hey, this guy's a little crazy, he's Generally, when we go back to the history of these lone offenders, they've been on social media saying negative things, uh, talking about supporting terrorism. They've said things to other people at work. It's that sort of thing. If we receive a call, we're not going to go out and arrest a person. We'll probably take their name, run it through the computer system, see if they're affiliated with anybody that we have a terrorist investigation on. Worst case scenario, we may go knock on the door and say, let's have a little chat. I have done that before as an agent with people suspected of terrorism who suddenly decided they didn't want to live in the U.S. anymore, convinced the FBI was on to them, and they uh, disrupted their plans. Uh, I had one case involving a person that had moved a large amount of money, about $700,000, on September 10th, 2001, taking it all out of his bank. And then on September 13, 14, he put it all back in the bank. Oh. Uh, so the presumption was with the, because they attacked the financial area of New York, were the banking system going to collapse? What did he know that, uh, and how may he have been in the loop? That person, the minute the, the FBI went and, got, and spoke with him, he was gone. He uh, out of the country and back to his home uh, country in the Middle East. So he probably had some information, but uh, didn't want to uh, stick around. More importantly, what could that money have been used for in further terrorism? Oh, yeah. Uh, so, you know, that's one of the things that happened in 9-11. There was a lot of funding. It wasn't an exorbitant amount of money. It was probably less than a million dollars. But still, terrorism takes money. That's another clue. Are people raising money, and what are they raising money for to carry out terrorist acts? We see a lot of fake charities as a way of getting money. Uh, you'll see things about supporting uh, children in refugee camps. There's legitimate charities, but you got to check it out. A lot of them are just fronts to raise money for terrorism. Oh, yeah. And, well, with the economy down, fraud goes up. And so that's uh, like charity scam is, is one of the top ones that's really on the rise. So. Like people, charities will rarely call you. And if, if they do, call them back on the number on the website. And that's, I think, a pretty easy fix on that. So um, sure, I get calls all the time from this police charity and uh, raising money for the cops. Well, cops don't raise money. We don't sell tickets to the policeman's ball like they have on television. Uh, all cops money is funded through city government, through taxpayers. There are no charities picking up the phone and calling you. 
if someone's doing that, chances are they're pocketing the money. And like you said, you have to be very careful on how you give. It's important to give. You don't want to stop, but you want to make sure your money goes where you intended it to go. Well, that's interesting about the policeman's ball and things, because I, I would get calls for that all the time. So is there a way to check those out? Are they all um, no, up to no good? Or what's your experience been on that? You know, uh, I would uh, ask specific questions of, well, what law enforcement organization does this benefit? And you can always call that organization. But I get calls constantly along the lines of, we're raising money for to buy police officer vests and stuff. Well, uh, there may be some legitimate things for that, but generally everything equipment wise, et cetera, is either purchased by the officer or funded through city government. So be very leery about calls like that, especially whenever there's a tragedy, whether an officer's killed, there's a terrorist attack, there's a major hurricane. That's when people kick these online charities into gear. Uh -huh. And because as Americans, we're wired, we want to help other people. That's, that's one thing that makes us unique. But criminals are out there, and there are plenty of them, as you know, that want to take advantage. Oh, yeah, absolutely. So anything else we need to look for is spotting a terrorist. Before oh, we get on to some fun stuff. Well, there, there are some other things. I will tell you, uh, uh, we have seen imitation vehicles, you know, uh, sometimes terrorists will go out and purchase police cars taken out of service, ambulances taken out of service, making them look like a legitimate vehicle with the idea of pulling up at a crime scene uh, where something has already happened and then they have a bomb planted inside the vehicle. Uh, so if you ever see a vehicle that doesn't look right, let the police know. They'll check it out. They'll know right away. The average person may not think, well, it's just an odd-looking police vehicle or ambulance, but that, is, that happens quite a bit, especially overseas. Huh. Seeing attempts of that here in the U.S., so it's just another clue to look for. It basically, the test is, if it doesn't look right to you, tell somebody about it. Wow, okay, okay. Now, you got another book. You got another book, and um, this one sounds like it's a good time, Disorderly Conduct. So... <laughs> Because uh, you got some stories in there that, that you say they're the lighter side of law enforcement. So tell us about why you wrote it. What's your favorite story? Let's, let's talk about that. So uh, Disorderly Conduct is about my 20 plus years in the FBI and some of the odd things I observed. It's going to be coming out this fall. I, I thought I'd try to time it uh, before Christmas, but after the riot. Somewhere in there. <laughs> <laughs> but... Um, Oh my God, that's funny. <laughs> there's, uh, there's a number of things people don't realize how odd things can be in the world. And I will tell you, cops are the only ones that get to see it. So, uh, for example, I, uh, I once had a, uh, a foot pursuit uh, as an agent, a guy who robbed a bank. Uh, it didn't last very long because he only had one foot. He had a uh, peg leg. Uh, <laughs> When he uh, decided he was going to make his getaway, he hadn't really thought this out. And uh, so uh, I caught him about a block from the bank. He, he hadn't gotten very far by the time I responded. Um, I've had other cases. I had one person who robbed a bank and then decided that uh, he, was, uh, at, he was a college student. He had uh, a theater major, if you will. And he was in a play at the college and when I showed up to arrest him, he was actually on stage and I figured out what the heck. And so I had gone on stage and arrested him during the play and the audience was a bit confused. I think they thought we were part of the play uh -huh. because after handcuffing him on stage and escorting him off, they applauded. So uh, <laughs> it may have been a very bad play. Who knows? And they were just thanking me for ending it. But uh, so there's odd moments uh, during the career that uh, you'll just never know what's going to happen. Oh, wow. Anything else just entertaining like that? I mean, did you watch the play a little bit or did you, were you like, nope, that's the guy, let's go? Uh, we had sat in the audience for a little bit and I was like, this, I can't do this. Uh, it, was, it was awful. Uh, it was some uh, student written Greek tragedy. That's another thing if you're going to rob a bank. So my subject 
was a uh, tall 300 pound African American man who had dyed his hair bright blonde for the play. Well, that made him pretty easy to pick out from the surveillance photos of the bank. It didn't take us long to figure out he must be go to the local college here. And one thing led to another that enabled us to identify him and him being part of the theater department. So, um, uh, by the way, he's out of prison doing very well. I uh, uh, really turned his life around. It was, it was a one-time thing for him. So, uh, glad to hear it. Um, you see crazy things in law enforcement all the time. Uh, I had one person who uh, burned down his business because it wasn't doing well. He wanted to collect the insurance and commit insurance fraud. And part of his insurance claims were that, you know, he had a, uh, a hot tub in the business uh, storage that had been destroyed, etc. And so I went out to his house and uh, went through the Navy's yard, climbed the fence, and there he is soaking in uh, the very hot tub that allegedly burnt down. So I took pictures of him doing that, gave him a little wave, and next thing you know, he was arrested and uh, off to jail for insurance fraud. So... Um, Great stories from uh, law enforcement that most people will never see unless you're in law enforcement. That's why I wrote the book to share. Oh, wow. Well, I can't wait to get a copy of that. So that's available, you said, after the riots before Christmas. So um, that We're means... Shooting, uh, so we, uh, and in all honesty, we, the release was supposed to be sooner. With the way the world is right now, not a lot of people are running out to buy books uh, pro law enforcement and... Uh, unless they want to burn them. And I encourage you, if you want to buy them, to burn them. Uh, a royalty is a royalty. So I mean, uh, <laughs> feel free to do that. But uh, uh, so we, but the release date by the publisher was pushed back a little bit, probably going to be after Thanksgiving. Okay. Okay. Got it. So, and that'll be on Amazon everywhere you get your, your books and it's called disorderly conduct. So, um, okay. Just parting thought here. What is the number one thing that people can do to protect themselves these days in light of everything that's going on i'll let you pick your top tip to leave people with you know i think people are they you're right they they are sort of not aware of their surroundings and i think you have to be aware of your surroundings when you go and leave the house and maybe we notch it up just a little bit however when we're home safe in our office and we're on the computer uh, we tend to let our guard down. And that's when you have to be careful. Uh, if you're going to become a victim financially, chances are it's going to be on the computer. Just some very basics. Have a good password. Make sure you have a different password for everything. That way, if one password's compromised, nothing else is compromised. Make sure you never click on a link that you don't know who it's from or what it is for sure. Have all your software and patches up to date. Whenever you get a notification that, hey, we have a new patch for Microsoft, that's because they found the vulnerability that somebody can get in. Just taking those basic steps. And here's probably the biggest tip I'll give people today, and I, you as an expert probably already know this, but if you're going to use a credit card, don't use a debit card. Use a credit card. Now, a lot of people like to use debit cards because I don't want to run up credit. I want to pay my bills. Just pay your credit card bill in full at the end of the month. I compromise your credit card, it's the bank's money. Chances are you're not gonna get a loss. I compromise your debit card, it's your money. Now you gotta argue with the bank to just give you money to replace what was stolen from you. A lot harder to do. The other thing, finally, I use two credit cards. I have a credit card that I use every time I go shopping outside my house. I have a second credit card I use online because Believe it or not, the one that's most likely to get compromised is the one I use out of my house. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, skimming and all sorts of things like that. When you turn your credit card over to the waiter or at a restaurant, you don't know who's looking at that credit card, et cetera. That's true. Online, that is a big one. Online's pretty secure. So what happens is if my, one of my credit cards is compromised, it doesn't disrupt everything. Think of all the automatic payments you have set up on credit cards. Yeah. Your, your newspaper and various things. That I call my online credit card. If I use my one in the real world, which gets compromised about once every two years, I don't have to worry about changing the credit card number for all the other things. So don't use a debit card. 
and have two credit cards, one for the real world, one for the virtual oh, world. Oh, I love that tip. That's a good one. Okay, so you um, you do keynotes all over the country. Well, you're probably virtual a lot like, like me right now. Um, how so can people- get back though, fortunately. I'm starting, i um, getting booked quite a bit for 2021. So I think people have confidence we're uh, getting behind this. Well, I think so. I actually had a live event last week, which was, it, it just made my heart uh, sore uh, just to see people again in a conference room. So um, what kind of groups do you speak to? How can they get a hold of you? Well, I speak to a lot of corporate America, financial groups, especially because of cybersecurity. If you're using a computer, you probably want to hear from me because it's not just about me. It's about keeping your family safe, keeping your business, keeping your kids at home. I've done a lot in the world of predators. Go just like the Dateline shows you see on TV. Yeah. I did that in the FBI for years and years, and I've written another book on that. WTF? Uh, why teens fail? What to fix? Oh. So uh, a, about the issues that keeping your children safe. So if you have access to a computer, I talk about that. But I also talk about active shooter and terrorism. Uh, I don't know if it's fortunate or unfortunate, but I seem to have been on the scene of a lot of active shootings. Uh, I was called in uh, within minutes after Gabby Giffords was shot, the congresswoman down in Tucson. Oh, boy. I flew into uh, Las Vegas to give a keynote. I arrived about an hour before the shooting at Mandalay Bay. Oh. And uh, so I wound up uh, covering that for the national news for three days. As a police officer, I resol responded to two active shootings at schools in progress. So I come in with a very different perspective on active shooter. I have videos and audio recordings to put you in the middle of one, and I teach you what you should do during it to keep yourself safe. And also how to spot the warning signs in advance to hopefully prevent. So with that said, I'm an easy guy to find. FBI John, it's uh, FBIJohn.com. My phone number, 866-FBI-JOHN, uh, or you can email me at johnfbijohn.com. And finally, uh, follow me on Twitter because every single day I put out a tip on how to keep yourself safe at FBI-JOHN. Oh, I love it. John, thank you so much. You are just fantastic. Thanks for having me. It's been a pleasure, and uh, best of luck to you, and I hope you'll have me back someday. Absolutely. Absolutely.